Good evening, everyone. We are here in the Health Sciences Building at Tarleton University. I'm my name is Nastalia Miller. I'm Kanyaka Haka from Gahnawage of Japan. And I'm an associate professor in the School of Indigenous and Indian Studies. I am also, I'm also the inaugural, inaugural associate, associate vice president, vice president of teaching, 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 learning, and research. research. So, so I am also, I'm also um, quasi director, initiator of, of the Indigenous, Indigenous Research, Research Institute. Institute. With my with colleague, Melanie Burke, uh, we have, have an MSM and science department. Science department. Uh, we have we have brought you here brought today, you here today um, um, along, along with, with uh, Hilding uh, Nielsen. Nielsen. As our, as our guest, guest. Healing, Healing is, is um, um, going, going to be, to be um, speaking, speaking with us, with today, us today, today here in a live, in a live and, and online, online, manner. online manner. Dr. Dr. Nielsen, Nielsen describes, describes himself, himself as an interdisciplinary, as an interdisciplinary science scientist. scientist. He studied, he studied astrophysics, astrophysics and mathematics at St. Mary's, Saint Mary's University, University in Halifax. In Halifax. And completed, and completed his PhD, PhD in astronomy at the University, University of Toronto. He characterizes, he characterizes astronomy, astronomy as the, as the ultimate, ultimate detective, detective story. story. As a Mi'kmaq person, person, he strives, he strives to, embrace to embrace and integrate and indigenous, 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 indigenous knowledges, knowledges and, methodologies and methodologies to better to understand, better understand the physics, physics and stars and the universe, and the universe at, and our place, and our place in it. More specifically, he probes the physics, the physics of stars from the nuclear burning core out to out a certain, certain stellar, medium, stellar medium where stellar, where stellar winds, winds interact, interact with the interstellar, the interstellar medium, medium to understand, to understand connections, connections between, between stars, stars and planets, stars, stars and, cosmology, and cosmology, and stars, and, stars and, us. and us. He exploits, he exploits theoretical, theoretical and numerical, and numerical tools, tools to compare, to compare with, observational with observational data sets, data sets to reveal the hidden the physics, physics of stars. Of stars. He enjoys, he enjoys teaching, teaching at the undergraduate, at the undergraduate, and undergraduate levels, levels, as well as, as, well as participating in public, public outreach and science, and science communication, which he's doing here, here tonight. His postdoctoral post research, research, research brought him to Germany and, and the States. United States. He then came, he then back, came back to Canada, Canada to teach at, teach at the David, the David A. Dunlop, Dunlop, Dunlop Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, and Astrophysics at, the at the University of Toronto. Dr. Nielsen is now at Memorial University in Newfoundland. He says, he says astronomy, astronomy is, a is a science, is a very, is a very interesting, interesting phenomenon, phenomenon since there is there's only one sky. sky. When, so when, so when teachers, teachers and educators talk about talk science, science, physics, and understanding, and understanding constellations, constellations, that's all that's coming from one view, one view of, the sky, of the sky, where our where elders, elders and our knowledge, and our knowledge keepers, keepers have a whole, have a whole different, different view and perspective. And perspective. Indigenous, Indigenous students come, come with a whole, with a whole set, set of skills and understandings, and understandings that most, that most Western, Western or non-Indigenous non -Indigenous science scientists, scientists do not have. have. Hopefully, Hopefully, Indigenous, Indigenous students, students will take, will take the, time the time to embrace that, that knowledge, knowledge and, to and think about, about how, to, how use to use it to better, to better understand, understand our universe, our universe from both lenses. lenses. Hilding's, Hilding's research focuses on the stars, stars and planets and really understanding the physics of how stars work, how they influence the planets. He approaches, he approaches his work by asking, by asking how does my how does work, my work impact, impact or influence, influence indigeneity, indigeneity or, or conversely? How, how does, does indigeneity, indigeneity impact, impact my understanding of my work? Recently, Recently Dr. Nielsen, Nielsen listened, listened to knowledge keepers Wilfred, Wilfred Buck tell three stories of astronomy, astronomy, like the bear like constellation, constellation and the three, and the three dogs, dogs and wonders, why they, along with the Mi'kmaq story and knowledge, are not are part, not of, part academia. of academia. He has integrated indigenous, indigenous, indigenous methodologies and methodology ways of knowing into his research as, as opposed, opposed to looking at things from a strictly Western, Western perspective. perspective. And I'm, and happy, I'm happy to say, to say that we, we had a long in this, this afternoon, afternoon, or this, or this morning, morning actually, actually, and he's and contributing he's to an upcoming bundle that, that, that we're working on um, about, about indigenous astronomy. So we're very fortunate to have been able to have that conversation with him. So, so I would I like, like you all, you all to welcome Hilda Nielsen as he, as talks, he talks to us tonight, tonight about, about space as part, part of the land. Of the land.
No. Oh. Because if you use a map, you might. Maybe one of us might have a computer. Is that right? Can you ask if that works? Are you still getting it? Yeah. 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 Could someone let us know if uh, on chat? Yeah. I could know more. That's good. Okay. okay. Thank you Thank very you much. Very much. Thank, Thank you for that, for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. introduction. I uh, wish I knew that person was. I swear, I swear that's, that's not me. me. <laughs> I, it's a great pleasure to be I here this evening. Uh, uh, a, a, I get to I get travel out of Newfoundland and what a little bit of the cold and wet winter there, the dry and cold winter here. But also, it's a great chance to come talk to you about space and all these wonderful things. One of the ideas and concepts that colleagues and I have been really exploring the last few years is issues around indigeneity and our role in space, outer space, that is. And to start us off, it was important to acknowledge and remember that indigenous peoples have been on this land and all lands on this continent since time immemorial. Whether it's Shone, Rima, Inuit, whoever. This land this has been indigenous since long before, long before the first English, 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 Spanish people came here. Came here. And, and as such, such everywhere, everywhere on this land is indigenous. indigenous. From, From the northern, northern tip, tip of what we call Canada, Canada to, 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 to what we call Mexico, Mexico today, today, from Newfoundland on the east coast, BC on the west. The west. Indigenous, indigenous peoples have lived have here. Lived here. Not, Not just lived here, but explored the land. Had a relationship with the land, have continued to have relationships with the land, living under one sky that they observe every night. And the ability to look in the night sky and see it every night is a very powerful tool for understanding our universe. Whereas today, many astronomers like to use telescopes and spectrographs and JWST telescopes, James Webb, and, and Hubble's. Just to have a look at the next guy in the dark spot where every, every night for millennia is its own science. It's a science that observes and remembers the night sky. And that builds a relationship that is very sensitive dependent on where we are. It is a different relationship if we are in Newfoundland, if we are in Nunavut, if we are in South Dakota, if we are wherever. And that relationship, that relationship is important, important to, remember. to remember. The reason, the reason is we can explore, we can explore the land through land astronomy. astronomy. Our, Our stories, stories depend on where we are. are. If we tell us a, a story here, it's not the same story as we told somewhere else. Because it's, 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 it's not, well, it is one sky. The view of it is going to be a little bit different. Bit different. And that's incredibly that's important because it connects us to the land and our stories. And if you think of the extreme case, if we are in the Arctic, we're going to see one night sky. If we're in Australia, we're going to see another night sky. And that, that will impact the stories we tell. That will impact the knowledge we have. So for instance, the most extreme case is the moon. Our view of the view of the moon are different if we're in the southern hemisphere. You know, you know, the moon, the moon peaks, peaks from one side, from one to, the side other, to the other, depending where we are. Where we are. As, an, as astronomer, an astronomer saying science, science we, we, I never, I think, never about think about this. It's just something that never occurs to me. The moon. But, but I dare you to talk about the moon being backwards to the southern, southern hemisphere and see what happens. what happens. You may you not get a warm And the and reason this is important is this concept. I kind, I kind of like calling it an axiom. axiom. It makes it really sound important and scientific. scientific. But, but it's, it's, I don't know, I don't know ideas, ideas or concepts that are developed around indigenous knowledge. This, this is work, work you know, by, by Daniel Ike a, a little while ago now. And he, he wrote a long, long wonderful paper for all people, but all the things that makes indigenous knowledge, indigenous science. And here I just kind of saw, but I have to know. There is no there is such no thing such as a pan-indigenous science. science. 
Science for people in Unagi is not the same as the science for Anishinaabe. It's not the same as science for Seneca and so on. But there's a lot of commonalities. So things, so things we ideas we can sort of travel. travel. I mean, perfectly, I mean, not perfectly we travel, travel, a travel a bit. One is, One is what, what we, we see above reflects, reflects below. below. That's, That's very much about the connection to the land and the sky. Land the sky. Knowledge, knowledge is relational. Is relational. As, a As a scientist, scientist this is a very hard thing to see every time. Every time. Because, because the, the, my PhD screen is screens now. It's objective. objective. It is not. It's relational. We have, it, yep. is not it is not an object, an object. it is an it action. Is action. Knowledge is something All we do, something we do not, not, have. not have. There are there stories about how indigenous knowledge, how knowledge really works, works to really consider works multiple, multiple variables concurrently, concurrently in ways that are very, ways different, are very different in Western, in Western science. science. In Western, in Western science, science, when we do an experiment, we do an experiment let's say we want to test the strength, strength of gravity, gravity. We'll, we'll drop a ball, and then we'll drop the same ball from a different height. And so we vary the height to see what happens. We try to, we try to, try to disentangle, disentangle one variable, one variable from, another. from another. For many, many indigenous people, how, how things act concurrently. Act concurrently. You know, there's you know, there's stories of caribou, caribou migration in northern Canada. Canada. In, these in these migrations, these migrations the caribou, caribou every year take a slightly different path. path. That, path that path depends, depends on many things. things. You know, the, you know, the past, past winter, winter, current season, landslides, rain, who knows. And, and trying to model, model that on a computer, computer or with theory, theory that's, that's kind of reductionist in, in a scientific way, way. is very difficult. Very difficult. But the, but the, the chiefs, chiefs and the elders, and the elders and the knowledge and the knowledge they know. They know how they not, not only predict the migration of the caribou, how to manipulate it. Because they see all the variables together, and they know from experience, from learning, how to make, how to bring all these things together to manipulate the caribou migration. It's, it's important, important to acknowledge, to acknowledge for many indigenous people, people's knowledge is holistic. holistic. Not religious holistic, holistic. holistic. Just everything, everything holistic. holistic. We like we to like think, think in astronomy, astronomy or science, science, I have, I have my, my science. science. I work I in a physical, physical thing, thing over here, over here. chemistry, chemistry over, over there, there. Medical, medical science, science is a building over there. there. But, but that's, that's an arbitrary silo. For many indigenous people, the stories you might tell the sky is also a story of biology or is a story of ethics. It is not, not just, just one, one theory, theory one thought, applied to applied one, to one field. field. And of course, of course nature is familial, familial for many, many people. You know, we, we, are not ta- we, we do not see many indigenous people do not see themselves above, above per se, the animals, animals or the sand or the trees, but equal. But equal. But equal. No. And, and being familial means being, means being in a relation, relation. being connected. connected. You know, yeah. you, you, it, it is not, not the other, it is not a other, thing that we own. We own. And, and I think it's worth, think noting, it's worth that noting that these kind of acts of ideas, ideas can, be, can be thought of a ways, of ways to complement Western, Western traditional science. science. And, and I always, I always like, like kind of putting, putting the, the, the traditional in the Western science, 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 not the indigenous knowledge, because, because yeah, yeah, they've been harping on this for five or six years. So now they can be called the tradition. So, one place one we place look, we look is, look the is the Sundagger. We, we travel, travel to the Sun Coast today to celebrate the United States. States. In, 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 in the New Mexican, in the New Mexican desert, 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 you know, the, the, the Apache people, the Pueblo people, people, the Hono, they, they all live down, down, there. down there. And the people travel across the land regularly. And in Chaco Canyon, in the natural part of the U.S., there's a cave. At the entrance of the cave are three stones, slabs lined up vertically. And depending, and depending on the time of the year, the, year, the sunlight, the sunlight when it rises, when it rises shine in through, through the eastern entrance, entrance and, illuminate and illuminate the back the wall of the cave. And what you see here, see here is the illumination, illumination overlaid in different, different times. times. So, so in this, in this, in this, in this uh, uh, sun dagger, you have two spirals, spirals, one big one spiral, spiral here, here, and on, and on the side of it, a smaller spiral, spiral going the other way. The way. And, and if it's the summer solstice, you get one kind of image. If it's equinox, you get another image, likewise for the winter solstice. Having this makes this a very powerful solar calendar. But it's not just a calendar for a measuring time, it is a map. The spirals are not you know, east, west, north, south, but it is coming and going, the direction of travel that you need to take. 
So I'm so seeing this far as to tell you which way to go and leave to get where you're going. Where you're going. So, so, so the story so the here has multiple, has multiple usage. Multiple. Similarly, Similarly, if you go, go to the high, the north, high north, to Lanyard, Lanyard, Inuit, Inuit, this, this might, might be the next guy you see. see. If you're, if you're looking, looking south, south, you'll, you'll see, see what we might call, might call, call Orion. Orion. If you're, if looking, you're looking towards north, north, you'll, north, see, you'll see the Big Dipper. But there's but one star that's very interesting. And I'm sorry to mispronounce it because I have a little is the flickering star. And in this story of two boxes, one fox is white, white one fox is red. And they're very playful boxes. They chase each other around, around in circles. circles. So when you're when looking, looking at the star, star you'll see a few color, color flickering, flickering red and white. white. And the amount, the amount of, flickering of flickering tells you something about the weather. Because it's, because low, it's low in the horizon, horizon if you have, you have different systems, systems, the amount of flickering will change. change. So you can so use it to predict weather systems. And not even you necessarily use this all on its own. But in combination with knowledge of wind, Knowledge of wave patterns, 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 snow patterns. Snow patterns. This makes a very this makes accurate, a very accurate predictor. weather predictor. And this, this what we'll, we'll call atmospheric attenuation, attenuation, is something that, something that we don't really use when you use a model. model. This, this is kind of hard. Kind of but hard. if you're in the, in the north, north, it is a very, very ideal, ideal uh, tool. Uh, tool. From a different, From a different slightly different perspective, different perspective mm -hmm. if you go if towards western Canada and northwestern United States, there are medicine wheels everywhere. Many of these, Many of these are, are hundreds, hundreds of years, of years old. old, but this, but this the big horn medicine, medicine wheel is one of the, one of the largest known. No. Today, it, Today is it is a center of, of ritual and ceremony, ceremony. But, it's but it's also, also potentially an observatory, observatory and a calendar. And, a calendar. and, and this, this is sort of building on ideas, ideas taken from an archaeological astronomer. So, which is a fancy way of saying an astronomer is trying to do archaeology. Which probably means not doing either, either very well. Very well. But, but what, what was, was found, found is that depending on where you stand in the medicine wheel, you, you can actually see different, different times of star lines as the time of year. So it's a way, so it's a way of, of sort of measuring, sort of measuring time. time. And, and in this, this uh, work by Jack Hetty, where he mapped this out, depending where you stand, so if you stand at point F, and you look towards one of the other points, when you look, you look for, say, star Rigel, Rigel or, Sirius, or Sirius, you know, you know you're some you're distant time from a star solstice, solstice, or, a winter solstice. or a winter solstice. And so, and so the, stars the stars moving up and down, and down rising and setting and times, setting times next, next to the solar, to the solar calendar. calendar. Now, now, it's not clear that this is this really the really case, case, or really the really usage of, 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 of this medicine wheel, because Jack Eddy showed that his model works up to about the year 1800. Afterwards, Afterwards, the movement, the movement of, the stars, of the stars due to preception of the year shift away, shift away from this calendar. From calendar. So, so, and I, I should also, also know this has never been confirmed, confirmed by indigenous people's, people's to my knowledge of, of any people's, people's on that land that this is, is what it would be used for. for. So, so, you know, you know maybe, maybe the joke's on us. But what we see is these different cases, they're all different stories. They're all different, different tools, and they all have different, different purposes. purposes. And, and one of my favorite, favorite is from Imagi, which is Muir and, and the Seven Bird Hunters. Bird hunters. And, and as you can see, see in this image, image you have, have Muir, the, the bear, bear, being followed, followed by, by a number, number of very, very hungry, hungry birds. birds. And we tell and we the tell story the story because if you look up above, you'll see the constellation of the stars. And it's reminiscent of the Big Dipper. The four stars of the Big Dipper is the moon. Followed, followed by the next turn, which is Robin, Robin. Followed, followed by Chickadee, followed by, followed by uh, Gray Jay, Jay. Followed, followed by Passport Pigeon, followed by Blue Jay, Jay. Saw Owl, and Owl. And we and tell, the story, we tell the story not over one, not one, night. one night. The story is told throughout the year. year. This is because the Big Dipper moves around the sky over one night. As certain polar stars, the sky rotates around us. But, we, but instead, we instead, we tell, we the, tell story the story around, around five, five or so in the morning, morning a couple, a couple hours, before hours before dawn. dawn. Little a little early for my taste, taste, but had each drawn. And we tell the story throughout the year. In that, in that case, case, we see, have the same perspective that across the year, the year at 5 a.m., the constellation is in a slightly different place and has rotated around the sky again. And so we start the story in the spring. In the spring, 
constellation points is vertically, vertically on, the left. on the left. This is mu and mu is waking up in hibernation. Long with your past, past, long sleep. sleep. And after such a long sleep, sleep, you're hungry. You're hungry. I'm, I'm always hungry right now when I sleep, when I sleep a lot. So mu and emerges looking for food. For food. When you was spotted by Robin. And Robin knows. The meat will feed people, the furs will keep them warm, the grease will be medicine. medicine. Robin grabs his bow and arrow and calls his friends. Shickety comes up fast, hearing a pot. And if you look closely in this image, second star after Robin is actually two stars. Shickety comes pot. pot. And the other birds follow behind and begin to hunt. As we move into summer, the trees and you run across the land. Trying, trying to keep, to keep up. up, not doing not so doing good, so good of a job. Of a job of moon is crappy, is crappy I guess. But, but as, as the season the wanes, wanes, falls coming on, coming on, the owls have fallen fall away from, away the, from hunt. the hunt. The, the those stars, stars are below the horizon. And, and but, but even though the, 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 those birds have fallen away from the moon, 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 is tired, moon is frustrated. Moon is angry. Moon gets on her hind legs and growls and tries to scare the birds away. This is Robin's chance. Robin fires an arrow, striking Muon in the chest. Blood goes everywhere, covering Robin. Robin flies into the trees, shakes off the blood, staining the leaves red, and except for one spot on his chest. Muon passes. The birds gather, chickadee with his pot. The other birds start singing, telling stories, and celebrating as they cook the meal. And we slowly move into winter. So this story of Muon isn't seen in, in our education system. It isn't seen in our textbooks or our classrooms. What we see is the story of Ursa Major, the bear with the tail. It is a story that is important from, from the perspective of you know, Greek and Roman peoples in history, maybe even today. But it is not a story of this land. And, and it's also very interesting Note that usually almost all the maps of Ursa Major are stick figures. This is purposely done in astronomy to delineate the maps, but also to sanitize the stories. We have this colonization that takes away uh, the stories of Muon and replaces them with these constellations. In that way, our view of the night sky is colonized. Our view of the constellations become colonized because. When we teach students in the classroom, we're teaching them about Orion and Ursa Major, Cassiopeia, all wonderful constellations, but they're not Mi'kmaq constellations, Innu constellations, Salus constellations. Even our textbooks, our textbooks have hundreds of pages talking about wonderful things about the Big Bang Theory, the formation of elements, planets, stars, supernova, black holes, general relativity, all that wonderful stuff. And maybe two pages, on indigenous knowledges. And those two pages will probably be largely on Stonehenge, the statues in Rapa Nui, Easter Island. Maybe they'll talk about some other structures, but almost but it's all based in this historical context, as if indigenous peoples were in the past. And that's not true. That is part of the erasure of indigenous knowledges. That's not unique to astronomy. But that it comes from the same place, which is a history and ongoing issue of colonization on these lands. This is a statue from where I grew up. If you look over, you can see the Bay of Islands outside of Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. This is the statue of one gentleman who gets all the credit for mapping it, one James Cook. I don't know why, as a sailor, he's pointed away from the water but we'll call that artistic license. He's, James Cook is famous in Newfoundland. If his name is everywhere, names of towns, streets, who knows? And he's also famous for observing an eclipse off the coast of Newfoundland. That observation allowed him to do timing measurements to do things like measuring the distance to the moon. And because of that, because he observed that eclipse off, off the coast of Newfoundland, not the course, off the coast of Newfoundland, he became handpicked to lead an expedition to the Pacific, in part as a compromise between the Royal Society of, for Science in the UK and the Admiralty. 
He was to sail a military ship to the Pacific to observe the transit of Venus. And he measured the timing of the transit of Venus. When Venus passes in front of the sun from two sides of the earth, you actually measure how far away Venus is in miles or kilometers from us. This was, would have been the first measurement of the actual absolute scale of our solar system. And he did it successfully. However, this then led to additional orders. He was given secret orders to go and quote unquote, discover Australia. So with great science comes great colonization. This isn't just a British phenomenon or a once in a while phenomenon of explorers. This is part of the development of the Western world through the movement of peoples as slaves and servants. Ships would sail from Europe to Africa, from Africa to the slave from Africa to the Americas, and then take goods back to the Europe. And those ships needed help. They needed precise measurements of things like longitude. They needed measurements of ocean tides. And astronomers needed measurements of locations of stars and observations of planets, as well as everyone wanted to get rich. So this played a significant role. Astronomy played a role in this trade. Some of the most famous astronomers, from Halley and Newton, who used the Atlantic to study physics, they produced star maps to aid navigation. And, if you, and many scholars have spoken about Haiti, which was the largest port for slave trade for a lot for many years when French as French brought slaves over. They astronomers uh, who are very famous today, such as I lost track of names, Duvalier, and so on. They mapped the longitude so precisely so that it would save the time of transit by weeks. So we benefited from this, and so did astronomy. Astronomy grew on the back of this trade as much as any other industry. But as telescopes, that really became a, new, a different tool of colonization later on. The first telescope in what becomes Canada was brought to, to Lewisburg and was today called Nova Scotia. This was at the time a French fort, because the French were the first settlers on that land before, the, before they went to war with the English and the English kicked them out. But a French soldier, uh, Chambert, brought a telescope to do science from, this, from that land. And he did for one year. So I got tired of it and went, went home. So, but that was the first telescope in Canada. Today, telescopes are everywhere. There's the David Dunlap Observatory in most today, Richmond Hill, the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory outside of Victoria, the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory in, in central British Columbia, the, uh, blah, 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 the Algonquin Radio Observatory in Algonquin Park. These telescopes are used for science. Hmm. Less so today, but much more so between the 1930s to the, to the 1980s. These telescopes were part of how Canada claimed land, particularly the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory outside of Victoria, which is built on a mountain on Salish territory without consent and was part of the uh, you know, development of Vancouver Island. But we don't do much astronomy using telescopes in Canada. For professional astronomers, you know, there's not very many high altitude places. The weather is not very consistent. So we look at other parts of the world. And primarily a lot of Canadian astronomy is done with telescopes in the United States. This is Kitt Peak in the southern United States. A number of observatories live here. The history of Kitt Peak is tragic. The land, the Hono Ono, Ono, and they signed over a lease around 1958. 200 acres of land uh, for which they get about $3,000 a year. It's pretty good that you 200 acres of land for the price of rent in Toronto. It is notable that this was, came about due to numerous discussions with leaders and elders of that nation, but it's also notable at the same time 
They weren't 100 years after the wars of invasion by the Americans. In that 100 years, they, lots of people were, were killed. Their reserve land was chopped up multiple times. And they were, by and large, abused by the American government. And so, in principle, as argued that gave consent for this mountain, but for use of Kapik, which is a spiritual mountain, for telescopes. But in 2005, they filed a lawsuit against the National Science Foundation over a new telescope called Veritas, which is a very long acronym that I can never remember, claiming that this telescope proposal had violated the, the National Historic Preser Preservation Act without consultation with the, the peoples of the land. And they won. So Veritas did not go on Kapik. He went outside the reserve to the next mountain, Mount Graham, which is also a spiritual center. You know, but also at the same point, Mount Graham faced similar protests because it is a sensitive area for many peoples, including Apache peoples. There were numerous lawsuits to stop telescope development, including this telescope here, which is called today the Large Binocular Telescope. Originally, it was called the Columbus Telescope because it was going to celebrate uh, 500 years. But, you know, didn't celebrate self-awareness. Eventually, the way around this, the U.S. government passed legislation to let the Forest Service allow three telescopes, not the peoples of the lands. So we see this over and over again, that all telescopes in, in Canada and the U.S. are on indigenous lands. And a particular concern is Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea is a, a very large mountain in Hawaii. From its base, which is well below the ocean, is, is one of the largest mountains in the world. And today it is a center of astronomy. If you look very closely in the center of this image, you can see the telescopes. All over this land that appears to be not very desert-like. Even though there, are, there have been 13 telescopes, including multiple 10 meter class telescopes on this mountain, Canada and other nations are partnering to build a 30 meter diameter telescope. The telescope would be basically the size of this room across. So it, it would be in a facility that would be stories high. So probably the size of this building. And we're gonna build that on top of the mountain. Mauna Kea. This telescope is important for astronomers because it means we get to do things like look for really dim planets and search for the first stars and do who knows what questions. But it is also Hawaiian land. Mauna Kea is a part of native Hawaiian territories. Hawaii was annexed a little more than a century ago by the U.S. government and what was a military coup. So Mauna Kea is Hawaiian, and many Hawaiians do not want to see this telescope. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so this led to protests. It's not the first protest, but TMT, the 30 meter telescope, became a rallying cry for protesters, for land protectors to fight further development on the mountain. And it isn't a new battle. 20 years ago, the CAC telescopes, which, is, which are two 10-meter class telescopes, as you can see in the image, on top of Mauna Kea, wanted to build smaller telescopes around it that they called outriggers, an allusion to the Hawaiian boat craft. They showed, it was shown that they did not meet the environmental requirements to build on that land. It was dangerous. But it was also a question of consent. Part of the issue was that they were not supposed to build more telescopes on the mountain. And so the astronomers were claiming these are more telescopes, they're part of the one telescope facility. But that's a bit of a cheat. There, are, there was no consent for these telescopes. And similarly, the proposed construction of TNT is a question of consent and indigenous rights on Mauna Kea. As such, 
it is not clear that TMT has consent because of the protests. Many Hawaiians may be in favor of it, many Hawaiians may be against it, but none, neither of which is consent for the telescope. And in the most recent planning stage of the Canadian Astronomical Society, where they created a 10 year plan for Canadian astronomy to build, to support new telescopes, initiatives, et cetera, they committed to not build facilities without Indigenous consent following the guidelines of the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I think this was a very valuable change, though the Canadian National Society has no standing with the telescopes. They don't have, and we haven't defined what consent means. Now, it's not in our place for the Canadian National Society to define consent, but, it's, but it can be very convenient for when we choose to. So there are a lot of, so while looking for consent and arguing that consent has to be needed is necessary, is important, it is still a, there is risk of manufactured consent. And this isn't just Hawaii or Southern United States, it is global. Most of the largest telescopes in the world are built on indigenous lands in Australia, Chile, Hawaii, Southern United States, British Columbia, and, and in Southern Africa. We build them there because these are locations that are high altitude, desert, dry conditions, and well, they're not near cities for the most part. So therefore, you know, we assume they're far, far from people or from many settler peoples, we consider them remote, which is not true. While those are optical telescopes, our great radio telescopes are also on indigenous lands. If you saw the image of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, these are the telescopes that took it. Telescopes working together from Greenland to Antarctica, trying to image this black hole in the center of our galaxy using radio telescopes in Hawaii, Chile, and so on. So they're also on indigenous lands. And so how do we decolonize astronomy? And you know, I'm not a huge fan of the phrase decolonize. It's, it's, over, it's overused these days. But we can't decolonize astronomy while building telescopes on indigenous lands. You know, we can't, we can't do build telescopes on the backs of indigenous peoples and, and then claim to be decolonizing. We can't decolonize and manufacture consent. We can't decolonize while pretending that basic token, tokenistic initiatives are good enough. For instance, in the case of the Kit Peak paying $2,500 a year in rent and letting people sell baskets in a gift shop, whereas the telescopes cost tens of millions of dollars to operate. In Hawaii, the TMT has promised a million dollars a year in air reach to Hawaiian communities. The telescope alone is a, one, is a $3 billion operation now. A million dollars a year is pocket change. So we can't decolonize until we create space and, and to have indigenous rights, peoples and knowledges exist, not only exist, but thrive and be part of the field in their own way, how they choose. And so we have to do these things to do better. But a colonization is not just the telescopes. Today we are moving into, into space and more and more rapidity. Or Conversely, we're also doing things like creating light pollution. Very recently, some guy in St. John's decided to put up a very bright light that you can see all the way across St. John's. Now, St. John's ain't very big, but if you can see this light, you could tell it was a problem. And it was a problem of light pollution that was interfering with people's ability to well to sleep next door. The study of light pollution is becoming problematic everywhere. Light pollution, we see it all the time. This is a very beautiful image. An image taken of, of the Earth from above over time, seeing the lights from, from places all around the world. And if we can see that light in space, that's light that's not being used. It's waste, it's trash. This is also in many ways a form of colonization. This is because 
light pollution erased is the night sky. When you cannot see the Milky Way or Great River, when you cannot see the stars or your constellations, how are we connected to the land? How do we exist on this land? What does it mean to have a connection with the sky when all you can see is this kind of gross, hazy, orange thing in the, in the horizon? This is a problem. It's not the only problem because not only is light pushing a race in the sky, on the other hand, we have ultra rich, weird people, to be polite, putting a whole bunch of satellites in the sky. And these satellites are damaging astronomy, for instance. This is an image taken with a telescope in Chile. And the streets you see are Starlink satellites just zooming across the sky. And there are more and more every year. Some of these can be seen with the unaided eye because they're bright enough. There have been now a couple of instances where they're having satellites that are brighter than most stars. And this is impacting how we relate to the night sky. <clears throat> and for what? Granted, the internet connection for my talk has dropped a couple times, but I don't think Starlink is the solution. You know, I think if we have to understand if light pollution erases indigenous stories, these satellites are changing them and rewriting them. This is its own form of colonization. Now, these satellites might benefit pe pe peoples around the world. You know, Starlink's been used in the Pacific in disasters, <clears throat> Ukraine during the war, currently. They've signed deals with some First Nations. But, you know, does everybody have a say in these satellites? Our, our view of the night sky is colonized. <clears throat> But this is also the sky that we that we live beneath. This is the map of an old map of satellites orbiting the Earth. You can see the bundle of low Earth orbit satellites. You can see a ring of the geosynchronous satellites. This is the satellites all around us. This is not just beyond that. There's also debris, you know, broken pieces of junk. There's who knows what else. And this is what's around us now. In many respects, this has kind of a gross allusion to the, uh, the, the ocean patch of plastic. And, you know, it's very easy to, you know, talk about this as an astronomer because it's messing with my ability to do my job. If Starlink's blocking all these observations, what can we do? But it's not just that. It's about asking who's making these decisions. You know, when that guy is the face of space, then space can't be the place. It's a problem that we have to deal with. Who gets to talk about space? Who gets to be in space? Who gets to work in space? And I think from the perspective of Canada, we have to return to this, this reality. Canada is built on indigenous lands. Whether they're treaty lands or not treaty lands, they're still indigenous. This means indigenous peoples have rights to, to this conversation. They have rights to decide what, how Canada operates in space. <clears throat> and those rights are very important because I don't, granted, I probably haven't read too many treaties on, and I would make the worst lawyer, but I'm going to bet not one treaty has the height limit in it. And if a treaty doesn't have height limit in it, does that mean, at what point do indigenous voices stop counting? So that's part of this issue, that you know, we, indigenous peoples have a right to space. And so these treaties are, and unceded territory mean that's a right to the night sky, a right to understand, to have a say in what satellites do and mapping. And these satellites can have a, can be far more dangerous than we know. It wouldn't, we have satellites that look down on us as surveillance, you know, Google Earth. Uh, there's a story of the NSA delivering two Hubble Space Telescope tubes to NASA only a few years ago because they were surplus. You know, surveillance with these satellites can grow. 
privacy can change, be lost. We don't, all these things are important come into play here. And so we need to be aware of these issues. This is true from space to the moon to Mars. Today, Canada is a part of the sort of nations embarking on a new mission. We're going to the moon again. This is probably the 15th time in the last 20 years we said we're going to do it, but we're probably going to do it this time. As part of this Artemis Accord and Treaty, or not treaty, uh, agreement, Canada is contributing to a mission to Mars or to the moon that will have a new space station that will orbit the moon. It will orbit the moon, and for a few months every year, here, scientists, engineers, whoever, will go up and do experiments and do what they need to do. The Canadian Space Agency has already had meetings where entrepreneurs and enthusiastic people trying to get rich are looking at the moon, uh, salivating over the minerals, the water uh, for propulsion, and the possibilities on the moon. And there are a lot of great possibilities. Space medicine is a thriving industry. The idea of doing surgery in zero gravity is actually kind of valuable because it, has, it carries a whole new way of dealing with issues of blood transfusions and you know sanitation. But Canada is going to go to the moon. Are we going to go dig it up? Or are we going to go learn about the moon? What are we going to do on the moon? And to be honest, from a scientific perspective, there's not a whole lot to do on the moon. You know, grab a few samples, take a few rocks. That's most of what we're gonna, we would need to do on the moon as scientists. So building this station is a commercial endeavor. And is the goal is the goal to take water so we can build rockets to go to Mars and, and have their, use the water for propulsion? Or is it to, mine rare earth minerals, the stuff that will go into our computers, our cell phones, and so on. But who gets to say that saying that? The moon is governed by the Outer Space Treaty of the United Nations. You can guess who, who never consulted in that. Basically anyone who isn't Europe, United States, and a few other countries. Now, instead of the United Nations uh, outer space law, a lot of this is being governed by something called the Artemis Accords. This is the uh, handshake agreement with NASA, CSA, Japan, New Zealand, and so on, to sort of govern goodwill as all these nations want to go to the moon. Largely, I think this is built on the idea that the Outer Space Treaty is a nation to nation agreement, and the Artemis Accord is sort of to privatize that. The Artemis Accord will do things like not fight in space, to help each other if need be, protect sites of historic importance on the moon. And that's all wonderful stuff, though. Who gets to say what is a site of historic importance on the moon? Now, for many people, the sky above is commons that we have a right to share. Indigenous communities and nations have every right to be part of that discussion and part of our resp the responsibility for our future in space. We have our relationships with the moon. The moon is not a dead object that we can mine, that many people seem to want it to be. It is a relation. It is perhaps a grandmother or a grandfather, it is perhaps a parent, but it is part of who we are in so many different ways. And to go to the moon and to dig it up and scar it is to change that relationship. And because right now, the sites of historic significance on the moon are essentially just going to be the landing sites from, from the US, but not necessarily the faces of the moon, not necessarily the Mara that we see from the Earth that tells us stories. And, but the moon is just the beginning. The re we're not going to the moon just to, to stop there. The moon is the launch point to go further out. Mars is the frontier that they, people want. Mars is Elon Musk's plan B. If he wants to go, he should go first. But, you know, other pe people want to go. And 
is this the world of our future? Is this a world we're going to go conquer? Is this, what, what about our relationship with Mars? The idea of going to Mars really kind of came, became serious in the 1950s, uh, thanks to Werner von Braun. As head of the United States program, he wrote the technical manual for going to Mars. And you can tell it's the 1950s, because the cover of his book looks like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. It's very interesting how, the, how this rocket program was justified in this respect. But as we continued, this view of Mars changed. Today, we see Mars more as the frontier of exploration. The, in, in the continuous trope of man versus nature, this is where we're going to go. And we're going to send Matt Demon, and Matt Demon is going to plant potatoes to survive. Uh, and, but treating that as the frontier where man, because guaranteed this will be a dude that goes up, is conquering nature, is problematic. It is the same trope that we had in many, so many times in the past. And unless, if we talk about the movie The Martian, I'm pretty sure we can think of a Western movie that's the exact same thing. Because it wasn't that long ago that this was the frontier of exploration. It wasn't that long ago that this was the land that man was conquering. And this is, was done in such a way because it was declared terra nullis, no one's land. If you weren't Christian, you didn't belong. This, was a, this ability to dehumanize people, to claim land, is a part of the Western model. And we're doing that on Mars and the moon. But terra nullis here erased indigenous peoples and rights. That was the purpose. It wasn't to sort of protect land or do anything productive with it. It was just to erase people and take over. Much of it was driven for resources and gold rushes and led to this manifest destiny, which drives solely this compulsion to go to Mars. So we have to ask, if we do go to Mars, are we going to have a Martian Nullis? So far, given the we've sent a number of rovers to Mars, we have very circumstantial evidence for life. There have been a couple of cases where it kind of looks like it, but eh, kind of like, but we've only scratched the surface. The, la the latest probe literally just took samples by scratching the surface, and we will pick them up at a later date. There may be life beneath the surface. Who knows how deep you have to go to find it, but we can't discount it. And so if we declare Martian Nullis, are we erasing life on Mars? If we go to Mars, are we erasing life there? Even if that life is simply microbial and more single cell or who knows. But more so, even in declaring Mars Nullis, we're sort of saying it's dead. Mars is its own world. It had its own history and life. It had running water at one point in its past. Today it doesn't. What right do we have to go to Mars and say, we're going to turn into what we want? Do we have that right to terraform Mars? And this idea of terraforming Mars stretches all the way back to ideas of sending comets, trying to redirect comets to hit Mars, use nuclear explosions, see if we can detonate something to cause the uh, volcanoes to explode, who knows? Basically destroy it to build a backup kind of concepts. But do we have that right? You know, do, does Mars have its own rights? This is the issue of familiar, familiarity I, I, I harken back to. You know, when we talk about rights, you think of rights of animals, think of rights of water. What about planets? Does Mars have a right to not be occupied and terraformed by us? Is Mars maybe Mars is happy the way it is? And I think this reflects a lot of the issues of this uh, difference between Western and indigenous knowledges. And the way we behave in this, print, in this concept comes back from the idea of primarily in indigenous people, for many indigenous peoples, nature is familial and a relation. In Western knowledge, it's built on the idea that nature is a hierarchy. 
we get to decide for everybody else. So this is important to remember that because of this, because we live on these treaty lands, we have to, we have an obligation as a nation, as scientists on this land, as rocketeers on this land, as miners on this land, that being on treaty lands means we live in a relationship. More so, the treaties aren't just between indigenous peoples and settlers. For many indigenous peoples, treaties are with nature, with animals, with plants, a, a reciprocity between them, agreement to support each other. And so do we have a treaty with the moon, a treaty with Mars, of how we behave with respect to each other? In that respect, you know, we the, that means trees are not just privileges, they're responsibilities. And what does that mean for interactions with those plants? Because these trees do not have a height limit. What does that mean for Mars, the moon? What about stars? Maybe one day in the future, great, 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 great grandchildren will go off and blast off to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, or who knows? What about those responsibilities? <clears throat> so, as I begin to wind down here, Things worth noting that, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't think I would win this case in court. You know, if we think of space as part of the land, Canada has a duty to consult with indigenous peoples, to embrace indigenous methodologies, and not just in astronomy and physics and curriculum, but in how we operate as quote unquote explorers and space agencies and engineering companies. It is a part, because we think of Canada as a treaty nation, then how Canada behaves in space depends on, on consulting with indigenous peoples from around this around this land. And I think part of that is asking, what do we give back to space in the night sky? So much of what we do in, in exploration is what do we get out of it? We go to the moon, we get materials. We go to Mars, we get a planet B. We go to space, we get bad internet from Starlink or Pepsi ads or who knows. And this is kind of reflected by the fact that much of our current view of the night sky is dehumanized. And the, according to the, you know, following the ideas of the archaeologist Alice Gorman, this comes from the idea that space is seen as dead. The moon is a, is a rock. Mars is another rock. Even though rocks probably aren't really dead. And we should be rethinking this view. You know, this view comes from the same idea of constellations as stick figures. Because this is a dead constellation, sanitized of its story, its history, and its meaning. <clears throat> Simply just a map of the night sky. Instead, we step back, maybe think about the stories like Mewen and the Bird Hunters, or Wolf of Bucks, the Great Bear, and so on. Maybe we get back by kind of changing how we deal with light pollution. Maybe we get back by returning to the stories of the night sky that build our relationships. Maybe we get back by changing our research and teaching methodologies that were more inclusive of other worldviews. Maybe we acknowledge that we're not the only things in this universe with rights. Not, not just us or, or the weather balloons that we keep shooting down, but everything has rights. So with that, I'll stop there and say, well, all yeah, and thank you. And I uh, thank you people, thank everyone online for patience uh, with me and my awesome tech skills. This is why I'm a theorist. <laughs>